Welcome to the latest edition of Circling the Bases. I'm DJ Short, and with me here once again is Scott Pianowski from Yahoo. Thanks to those of you joining us on Twitch this afternoon, really appreciate it. And for those of you listening in podcast form or watching later on YouTube or recording on Wednesday afternoon, which means it's time for another Waiver Wire Wednesday episode of the show, we'll each offer a few recommendations ranging from shallow leagues to deeper formats. So hopefully a little bit for everyone. Scott, how's it going, man? It's doing great. It's going great. And uh, I want to share, I'm going to paraphrase. I don't have the note in front of me, but I got some viewer mail from a friend of mine, an uh, old friend of mine, Tim. He's in my longest running keeper league, the Chelmsford League, which goes back a couple of decades. And he said, hey, bud, what's going on? He said, hey, I just, I'm paraphrasing. The note's not in front of me. But he said, hey, I, I like the new podcast with you and DJ. I listen to all the shows. He goes, just one critique and take it for whatever it's worth. You guys are so nice to each other and you're so deferential. You know, one person will say one thing and the other guy will say, Oh, yeah, that's right. I agree. I agree. I agree. You know, it's, uh, it's nothing wrong with disagreeing. I'm not saying you can be at each other's throats. And I will say to you, Tim, and to any dear listener who has had this thought, I just get out of a podcast relationship that was all about tension and all about disagreement. We'd have arguments before the show even started. So it's working with DJ has been a breath of fresh air because it's just such a positive environment. But I will look. For more, mo- we're not going to look. This isn't going to be one of the shows where we fake debates just to, you know, this yeah. isn't going to be like the Jim Rome, Jim Everett episode or whatever. No, that's never going to happen. But as I see when DJ puts out a take that maybe I disagree with, perhaps I've, I don't know, I think, do think we have a, a very similar approach in a lot of ways. But yeah, I think Tim's point is well heard. And yeah. I'm going to try to look for some openings just to say, okay, maybe this is a point that we disagree. And who knows, maybe an episode in the future, we'll try to find areas of guys i I know um both yahoo and roto world in the past in the preseason have done like debates where okay what third baseman would you take or what closer would you take or whatever like that maybe that could be something we explore in the future but i just want to say hi tim thanks for listening and keep those notes coming if you have feedback on the show uh, what do you like what don't you like uh, let dj know let i know send us an email send us a tweet whatever it is we'll certainly consider all thoughtful feedback yeah, and the same goes for you know a show like this, which is based around picking up players off waivers. Like when you pick someone off it, off, pick someone up off waivers, you're inevitably dropping someone. So it's easy to say like pick up player X, but like who makes sense to drop too? Like you know we can certainly talk about that as well today and moving forward. It's always easy to just put a list of players out there. Uh, but there's a lot more decision making that goes into that. So uh, certainly open to any and all feedback. And uh, yeah, bring it today, Scott. Let's let's go. Let's do it. By the way, I, I'll start with one argument. It won't be with you. It'll be with Lance Lynn. I finally cut Lance Lynn in the league because he pitched poorly in like seven straight starts. I know the strikeout yeah. numbers were still there. I'm like, oh, I guess this guy's 36. He's just torching my ERA and whip. And what, you know, his ERA was, I don't know, six or something like that. His whip was like 160. So finally, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to be that guy who just waits forever. I'm not going to wait for the definitive death knell. You have yeah. ruined my ERA and whip for the last time, Lance Lynn. And then, of course, he has his best start of the year last night. Yeah. Uh, picks up a win, you know, tidy ERA, hardly walked anybody. He always gets strikeouts. That's not the problem with Lynn. So I, I don't know if I played the market wrong. And you look, know, here's one other thing I want I want to, one other ethos I want to give you about picking up guys, adding guys and dropping guys. If you never drop a player that you regret, you are playing far too conservatively. This is like the poker player, sure. right? You, sure. You're supposed to get caught bluffing sometimes. If you're not getting, ever getting caught bluffing at the poker table, you're playing, if I know my friend Tim, the poker player, he'll understand this. You're playing far too conservatively. And I'll, I'll make it a really tidy fortune cookie piece of advice here. Being afraid to make a mistake is the mistake i like it that's good that's good and you know we're not perfect either like i had cal raleigh on the bench when he had two home runs the other Mm -hmm. night both sides of the plate at fenway park first catcher ever to do that and i i probably wasn't alone because he hasn't been great recently leading into that game but these you know these things happen um yeah i can convince one of my my co-managers to draw to uh bench isaac paredes this week we, we actually had a huge Tuesday night, but Paredes hit two home runs 
and that obviously would have added to it. And it's, you know, Tampa Bay can be frustrating because a lot of times they're just one of those teams, different lineup every day. Yeah. And yeah. with a guy that's a weekly league, I was just afraid we'd play Paredes. He might get 10 at bats or something like that. Now sure. it turns out with the two banked home runs, he could do nothing the rest of the week and he'd still be the right call. So co-manager Scott, if you're listening, uh, you know, Mea culpa. I hope I gave you good advice. I did get Nick Senzel into our lineup, and he had a good game at, at yeah. uh, Colorado. I still think Nick, Nick Senzel is an interesting guy. Um, but you're going to get some stuff wrong. And, again, I'm, I'm not going to play scared. Yeah, one of our readers here says – or one of our viewers here says, drop Paredes yesterday for Luis Ortiz. Mm. These things happen, you know. <laughs> uh, that's That's fantasy baseball for you. Just like regular baseball, it will humble you very, very quick. Uh, so today, as part of our Waiver Wire Wednesday show, we've been doing our pitch clock. It's now 40 seconds. We've, we've mm-hmm. taken feedback from uh, our listeners, as we're always open to. So it's now 40 seconds. Uh, Scott is on the clock today and has a chance to make his case for one of the latest call-ups. Top prospect, Matt McLean with the Reds. I want to hear your case for mixed leagues uh, to pick up Matt McLean. Yeah, you gave me probably the easiest call of the group. I can hear my dogs barking in the background. Those are Matt McLean, McLean endorsements. First round <laughs> first round pick. I know he didn't have a great 2022 in the minors, but look at this year. 348, 474, 710, triple slash, triple A, 12 homers, 10 steals. And the Reds desperate for a shortstop are batting him second in the lineup. So he's pro- I get it. A lot of people are listening. You say, yeah, of course, Matt McLean. I picked him up 48 hours ago. I picked him up on the weekend. I get it. But – Still under 50% rostered in Yahoo. He should be owned everywhere. Kick the tires, see where it goes. And look, Ellie Dele Cruz at some point will probably be up with the Reds too. We're going to figure out who man shortstop. But when you see what McLean did at AAA, that's an auto pickup. I, I would drop a player I liked to take a chance on Matt McLean. Yeah, I love the pop and the speed. You love the ballpark. Yes, Ellie De La Cruz will probably be up at some point this year. Christian Encarnacion Strand as well. With I think he hit another home run today. It feels like every day he's hitting a home run. A lot of talent in this Reds infield. We've been over this uh, over the past few weeks that they just have this this burgeoning infield core coming up. Spencer Steers there too, who you know has shown some potential at times. This is actually a perfect lead in uh, to our reminder to watch Sunday morning. Uh, MLB leadoff on Peacock. Watch live games all season long on Peacock. And this week, we have the Yankees taking on the upset-minded Reds in Cincinnati. Catch the action live this Sunday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time. You can watch Matt McClain. You can watch Aaron Judge watch the dugout. Uh, <laughs> and uh, see if he launches another home run. I'm just kidding, of course. And you, you can, of course, watch Jonathan India's hair flop around as, as yeah. he hopefully trots around the bases. He's having a nice season for the he Reds. Is. I, I yeah. still think the Reds, for a team that isn't going anywhere, you know, Alexis Diaz has been a hit as their closer. Mm-hmm. He's been one of the right answers in the bullpen. India's had a nice bounce back season. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm just going to die on the Senzel Hill. Um, if, if it happens, it happens. I'm a fan. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I think Tyler Stevenson at the end of the year will still be a top 7, 8, 10 catch or something like that. Yeah. So, Uh, The Reds are an interesting team, and the the Yankees always are worth the price of admission. And, and man, Judge has come off the the IL. He's slugging home runs. He's got a little bit of attitude. I I wanted to play him in Tout Wars DFS yesterday thinking, okay, he's mad. But, of course, Aaron Judge is just a good bet to hit a home run on any night. I ultimately didn't play him, and he did hit another home run on Tuesday night. But maybe he's ready for a binge. Let me me ask you one other thing before we get into the pickups. So Nolan Arenado homered in all three games of the Red Sox series at Fenway. Yes. And then he's homered since then on Monday and Tuesday. It's five homers in five games. You get all sorts of opinions on the hot hand. Some people have, there's been eggheads who have disproven it. There's been eggheads who have said, no, it actually exists. Yeah. It, the problem sometimes is in the definitions. Where does it really start? Where does it end? Where does, and I, I did play Arenado in, in DFS. He hit a home run, whatever. It's, it's a sample of one here. Where does DJ short, uh, rule when it comes to like hot hand you know this guy's home in the last few days this guy's you know done something well it's still a short sample how do we apply that if at all i mean i believe in it uh i think it's just hard to quantify it Mm -hmm. but how can you not like if you've homered in two or three straight games like how is there not a psychological benefit to that like you're just feeling good at the play like basketball players mentioned like you know it, it feels sometimes like you're you're throwing a ball into a like a swimming pool or something. You know what I mean? Like 
it, there's a psychological benefit, the confidence that comes from that. Again, can't quantify it, but we see this all the time. These players go on ridiculous hot streaks. I think a lot of a lot of it is just confidence and psychological. Totally agree. And and part of the problem with trying to prove it with numbers is just the definitions. It's just really difficult to know how you, where you put the error bars and stuff. And yeah. My feeling is if, if the opposite is true, if you can go in slumps, I'll give you a great example. It, it's a little bit of a scary real life example, but say you're just, you know, you're driving, you're a regular driver, you have a good driving record, you have a nice low insurance policy. And then one day somebody cuts you off and you get the near accident. Mm -hmm. I guarantee your driving confidence will be shaken for at least the rest of yep. that day, maybe for a few days, or maybe you get in a small fender bender or something. All of a sudden you convince everybody's going to hit you. And you're right. really, really nervous. And what was once a routine experiment, it's something you would do and not even think about it. It has you kind of in a tension filled moment. It has you on edge. Right. And right. Yeah. I think, I think being confident is, yeah, I, I used to work with a, a copy editor at a newspaper. I'm not going to mention his name. This guy was a wonderful copy editor, but he couldn't work on deadline. He couldn't work at night and say, Oh, there's a big NBA trade. We get to change the whole section. We're driving crazy. So they put him on non deadline layouts he'd like lay out the sunday paper or lay out special right. editions where it's like okay just get this done tuesday there's no pressure there's going to be no late nba trade that that ruins your mojo right and even though he was a professional because some people say well you know maybe my maybe my experiences as a golfer as a driver whatever i'm not a professional thing in those things but this is a guy who's a professional editor who's really good at what he did but for whatever reason, he couldn't handle the pressure of the deadline. So, I, you know, I think that's a real thing. I, if we're going to accept that choking is a real thing, and I think it is, then I think that the opposite can be true, where you're in a zone, you're in a, you get that hyper focus, your brain kind of kicks in. And someday, this may be even a little bit creepy, but I think someday they're going to be able to figure out like the brain chemistry of like NFL quarterbacks and what makes one guy better than the other guy. And it's not sure. the shallow run. It's not how much they lift or how big their hands are or something. It's going to be how they process stress and who has the lower heart rate in the heat of battle. Right. Yes. We probably will get that information someday, which will be, will be very scary. Uh, but uh, I, I think it will some, someday that, that information will be uh, quantified. Uh, for sure. But yeah, I think I, I think confidence has a ton to do with it. We're seeing more players be upfront about mental health mm -hmm. struggles they're going through. Uh, I think recognizing that these players are real people is is a very good thing to do, especially when. Yeah, I mean, we're number crunchers. We're playing fantasy or trying to win different categories of stats. But in the end, these are people. And it makes sense that you're feeling good at the plate you're going to be doing well if if you're in a deep slump and you look up at the scoreboard and you're hitting 175 like that's got to have an impact on you uh so i do think that's part of it and you know from a fantasy perspective yeah you want to see the evidence behind the hot streak ultimately to know if it's sustainable you know if they're hitting the ball hard or if they're making contact or they extremely lucky with batting average on balls in play like that stuff you want to look at but yeah i mean i think generally you want to ride that that hot hand and, and see where it leads. So uh, I'm definitely a believer in maybe not the hot hand theory, but I think there's something to it for sure. Right. And the idea would be in basketball, if, if you made a bunch of threes in a row, that doesn't mean you take a, a contested 40 footer or something like that. You're not Steph Curry right. all of a sudden, but if you have yeah. a good look, I would like your chances to make the next shot. So there's a, a nice yep. sidebar for you. I've lost our place. Is it your turn or my turn to throw it up? It's up? my turn. And I okay. am going to talk about, uh, hopefully we'll see a, a shakeup here with the Mets, at least as much of a shakeout as they mm -hmm. uh, shake up as they can make at this point. The Mets are six and 16 in their last 22 games. They're three games under 500 going into play on Wednesday. Uh, really the low point of the Buck Showalter era with the Mets. So the Mets are calling up Mark Vientos, uh, their number eight prospect, according to MLB.com. Vientos has just been on fire in AAA. Hitting 333, 13 homers, 1104 OPS over 38 games. He's now played 150 games in AAA, a very large sample. In those 150 games, he's hitting 294 with 40 home runs and 113 RBIs. You play this many games in AAA, it's, there's nothing left to prove. It's time for him to come up and show what he can do. I think the most encouraging part with Vientos is that he is mashing both righties and lefties. He's hitting 327 against right-handers, 357 against lefties. He had a 734 OPS against 
uh, right-handers last season in the minors. This year, he's hitting both. Uh, the other encouraging thing, strikeout rate for Vientos in AAA this year, 20.5% was 28.6% in AAA last year. So we'll see if that translates to the majors, but certainly encouraging. When you look at the Mets DH situation, Daniel Vogelback, the main DH there for the Mets, the Mets are 25th in the majors in OPS out of their DH spot, 677, 27th in MLB with a 213 average. I still think most likely we're going to see Vientos like sprinkled in against lefties, but there could be a chance for more. I mean, Vogelback just hasn't done a lot. He's very one dimensional. He gets on base, but he doesn't hit for power. I think if Vientos gets off to a hot start, he could really take the job and run with it uh, there in the DH spot. So available, and this was as of Wednesday morning, so maybe it's a little higher now. He's available in 95% of Yahoo leagues. I think that number is going to change very quickly but deeper mix leagues if you need a quarter infielder spot or utility spot uh, i'd speculate on his power potential because they need it in that mess lineup right now yeah it's funny you, you look at vogel back and he has the body type and the position that you, you think he'd be a power hitter but he just hasn't been i mean last year the no. obp at not 393 was great he only slugged 436 this year his 376 on base percentage you think oh that's great it's actually higher than his slugging percentage yeah. it's 369 so even though Vogelback probably profiles when you mash it all out, he's still over 100 in OPS plus. He's 109 yeah. this year. He was 138 last year. But the Mets have to do something. Unfortunately, Vientos can't pitch because that's what they really need help. Yeah. I mean, I'm starting to wonder if Ron Darling is the best pitcher on the Mets right now. But um, <laughs> you would think he's, there's a chance that, he's, that Vientos gets a, gets a spot. First of all, if you're going to at least play in the strong side of the, of the platoon, that that is worth it. I mean, we talked about Lamont Wade last week, who's crushing right-handers, not playing at all against lefties. But if you can just project that ahead of time when he's going to play, you know how to handle it, and he's still worth yeah. rostering. So I could see something popping here. Certainly the Mets have to try some stuff. My next guy is going to be somebody who's also producing a AAA. And I, I don't know really what's going to happen with, with Mickey Moniak. He's not going to be Mickey Mantle. I don't think he's going to be Mickey Mouse, even though he's playing in Anaheim. He's going to be somewhere in the middle. He's got a great name. Number one overall pick, as you pointed out. I mentioned him passing on Monday as a first-round pick. He said, no, no, he was the first overall pick, which he was out of high school in 2016. So the the Phillies, he was traded in the Syndergaard trade last year. The Phillies gave him all of 93 at-bats in the majors before they decided this guy couldn't play. Yeah. But Moni Moniak has played over his minor league career. He's played essentially a full year at AAA. 30 home runs, 497 slugging, and 12 steals. So, okay, great. If you're in a AAA fantasy league, pick him up. He at least <laughs> deserves a chance to do to, to get an extended trial. I realize he got a little bit of time with the Angels last year. It didn't go anywhere. This year he's only played three games, but he had two homer game. or, or He's got two homers already, two stolen base, a homer, two steal game to start. He hit a homer on Tuesday. There's one game he didn't play. The Angels, we know how top-heavy they are. It, it's Trout. It's out the golf course building Mike Trout. It's Shohei Otani. They just had lost Rendon, who's on the aisle right now. Moniak's still a young kid. He's still in his mid-20s. I picked him up. He's only 4% rostered in Yahoo. This is one of those, I picked him up in some leagues. I'm not starting him everywhere. I just think he's got power speed potential, a past pedigree, a latent pedigree we can look at. Maybe this is going to go somewhere. And, you know, in, in a week's time, 10 days' time, if it hasn't, I'll just drop him for somebody else. So 2016 draft, Mickey Moniak was the number one overall pick. Nick Senzel was number two. Mm -hmm. Not really a lot out of that draft, uh, to be honest. I am bankrolling the, the 2016 draft. <laughs> if Moniak and Senzel pop, man, I'm going to be waving $100 bills on this show. <laughs> Riley Pint was just recently called up. He was the number four overall pick. But this is not so far to this point. Alex Kirilov was picked number 15 by the Twins. But really not a lot here gavin lux was late in the first round uh but a name that you know i'm i'm gonna oh, kyle lewis is there like josh josh low he's he's making some noise right now but just really not not a ton there Ooh, kind of an ugly class right there which uh, i guess makes sense with the way things have turned out for moniac to this point but uh you know we'll, we'll see what let, happens let's point out by the way just to mention how how weak this class has been the uh the top war gatherer among everybody is Will Smith, who was the 32nd pick. And he, he looks great. He's basically an all-star mm -hmm. right now. And then it goes down to Cal Quantrill, who's been solid. He's like quasi-ownable in mixed leagues, even though he doesn't strike anybody out. And then it goes down to Gavin Lux, who, who I, I think Gavin Lux is just being a guy who's constantly hurt. 
Yep. Uh, it hasn't been Ian Anderson's kind of flamed out with the Braves. Eric Lohr, you know, a four or five starter for the Brewers, but he's hard to trust. One other name on this list, I'm going to mention him just because he's. We talk about the players you look at constantly and you don't pick up for whatever reason. I have, and I don't have him on my list. You don't have him on your list. I look at Dane Dunning like twice mm-hmm. a day and decide not to pick him up. Oh, he's yep. not going to stick in the rotation. He's not striking anybody out. And, and by, by the way, you don't want a guy who's not striking anybody out. I'll mention somebody who doesn't even have Dane Dunning stats, but I'm going to recommend him later in this segment. But uh, Dane Dunning has made. Uh, what 11 appearances this year, three starts. He's going to get right below one, um, seven walks, 23 strikeouts. I, I don't know what's going to happen when everybody's healthy there. Can I talk you into Dane Dunning? Yeah, I could be into it. He has that pedigree. He's he's had a little bit of success in the majors too. And I think given the nature of this Rangers rotation, you know, Andrew Heaney's injury history, we know Jacob deGrom, uh, he's on his way back, but who who really knows? Dunning's going to pitch a lot this year. We know that. Um, and with a pitcher with his pedigree, like if he makes a couple of tweaks, like he could hit. So I think he's a name worth keeping an eye on uh, for sure. The next name I want to talk about is Jorge Soler, which is odd because I expected him to be rostered in more leagues. But as of Wednesday morning, he was available in 71% of Yahoo leagues, hit a walk off homer against the Nationals. And Hunter Harvey, who I'm, I was high on <laughs> going into this week, uh, and seemingly getting a chance out of the closer role last night for the Nationals. That did not go well. I still like Harvey a lot, but uh, that is a blow for sure. But Solaire hit a rocket um, for the Marlins to win that game. And now Solaire, over his last 11 games, sitting 326, five home runs, 12, RB, 12 RBIs in that 11 game span, tied for 10th in the majors with 10 home runs. The contact rate has been up from last year. Still not expecting a ton of help in batting average, but Soler hits the ball extremely hard. There's nothing phony about this. Like we know the power is top tier. And I expect that to continue as long as he's healthy. I don't think the Marlins stadium holds him back. Like his power can play anywhere. And he was a natural rebound type of candidate. I could see I could see Soler hitting 30 homers this year easily. And I think that number should be a lot higher. Yeah, the roster tag doesn't look right. Remember that run he had where the the Braves basically rebooted their outfield at the end of the 2021 mm-hmm. season? Solaire plays a third of the year with the Braves, 269, 358, 424, and hits 14 home runs. Yeah. And last year, I thought he was an interesting pickup for the Marlins. And even though his slash was ugly, he still hit 13 home runs in 72 games. As you yeah. say, he's already got 10 and 40 games this year, well on his way to having a, a positive power year. The 238 average won't kill you. And they're giving him decent lineup real estate. I realize this lineup isn't as much fun with Jazz Chisholm on the IL, but Solera's last five games, he's hit second or fourth in every game. Why not go with it? In fact, yeah, I almost mentioned Marcelo Zuna, who his seasonal numbers won't look good for you. He was another guy that the Braves – kick the tires on he's still with the team but um he's over the last three or four weeks has had great power numbers and the average has been playable i think he's maybe under rostered at the moment here's what i blew here's what i I just got i I, i'm in too many leagues and i didn't realize jake fraley was available in one of my deeper mixed leagues and he was picked up by my cousin dj last couple of days you can't touch those djs man (laughs) jake jake fraley 37 percent rostered I don't get it. He's played 106 games with Cincinnati and he said 17 home runs, nine stolen bases, a 119 OPS plus. He's getting run right now as their second or third hitter. We know, as we mentioned earlier, great American ballpark is a great place to hit. Mm-hmm. You're not projecting anything on Jake Fraley. You're just asking him to be the guy he's been for the Reds over the last like three or four months. He's a good right. hitter, man. He's he just is. one of those late bloomers. He should be rostered. I think two thirds shallow leagues. Maybe you don't roster him, but he should be 60, 65, 70%. And again, I blew it. I, I couldn't believe how how he got picked up in a league of mine when I, I was desperate. And maybe outfield, I, I don't know if I had a fifth there, but still, I just didn't realize he was available in that league. It just shows the importance of doing your diligence because a lot of times it's, it's frustrating when you look for a player and you know he's probably gone. I mentioned McLean earlier. I'm sure a lot of you will go through all your leagues up, oh, take and take and take, and that's no fun. But uh, I Jake Fraley slipped through the cracks. Don't let him slip through the cracks of your leagues because he's still 63% unrostered in Yahoo. Yeah, I think the Reds have a lot of these kind of players who make sense on mixed league rosters. And yes, the you know the hitting environment is, is part of it. But 
Uh, the Reds are one of those teams that, yes, on paper, not a great team. Their rotation has not been great. I believe their their starters ERA is north of six, uh, 29th in, in the majors. Uh, Hunter Green's been up and down. Nick Lodolo is hurt, going to be out for a while. Graham Ashcraft has been really the one who's stood out this year. So not much help there. Fantasy Diaz has been great in the closer role, but not much help pitching-wise with the Reds. And that is holding them back. But the the hitters, they're going to keep on coming, as, as I just uh, mentioned. So uh, I'm going to mention another pitcher here. And I believe he was on the Reds at one point. Alex Wood, available in 91% of Yahoo leagues going into Wednesday. Uh, he suffered a left hamstring strain on April 19th, but made his return Monday against the Phillies. Allowed two runs in four and two-thirds innings, four strikeouts, one walk. 14 swings and misses in 72 pitches, which was really nice to see. I know the recent history hasn't exactly worked in his favor. Wasn't great last year. Has had some injuries. But gets the Marlins this weekend without Jazz Chisholm. Then the Brewers, who really struggle against lefties. The Pirates, after that, who have struggled recently, come back down to earth. I think this is a good time to jump on board with a pitcher who you can stream or maybe just hang on to for a little bit, especially... You know, if you're dealing with injuries in your fantasy rotation, uh, I think he could perform well, at least in the short term. So, uh, Tim, you're going to be happy. I'm going to give a little pushback on Alex Wood, who I picked up in the league that we're in together. I'm not like talking okay. out both sides of my mouth. Wood pitched Monday. I realize they're, they're trying to amp him up. He, he's missed mm-hmm. time. So you maybe you don't want to go super deep with a starter who's just rejoining the rotation. But I think he's only faced two or three batters this year in the third time through the order. So I am petrified. Alex Wood was pulled Monday with a lead, needing one more out, a multiple run lead. All he needed to do was get one more out. And I think it might have been Trey Turner who they pulled him for. They didn't want Turner to come up. Nobody on base. I I would have thought, hey, just wait until somebody gets on base. I'm not saying you have to manage as a slave to the win rule, but you couldn't let him face one more hitter. I right. wonder if the Giants are so in bed with analytics that they're like, "Oh, Alex Wood, you're you're an eighteen pit, you're eighteen batter guy." And as far yep. as that's, think about it, right? You, if you are perfect for five innings, that's fifteen batters. I'm just worried it may be hard for him to get wins. I like him as a pitcher. I've always thought he had that herky jerky wind up and delivery that I think can be hard for batters to pick up. I, the Giants are an interesting team defensively. It's usually a pitcher favoring park, although there's been years it didn't play to that profile. I like Alex Wood for quality innings. I'm just a little bit nervous. I think the Giants are going to have such a quick hook on this guy. Yeah, so he he threw 46 pitches in his only rehab start. I think the pitch count is is a valid concern. Uh, I think maybe he's still getting ramped up, but I do think given the way the Giants think, it's a possibility. It's something to keep an eye on. But also he wouldn't have been ready to throw 90 pitches anyways. Sure. So we'll I see what the pitch count is. Just let him time. finish the fifth. Let him finish the fifth inning. Yeah. Let him at least get yeah. in a jam. Let him. One yeah. guy gets on fine. You're ahead by like four runs. Right. Also, another thing about Alex Wood is there's been such a high level of injuries, and I don't know. We'll find out if some people speculate maybe the new rules are leading to the injuries. The pitchers aren't mm. pitching in their normal flow. I don't know. Look, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a major league pitcher either. So I'm not even a pitching coach. I'm just somebody who watches a lot of games from my office TVs, but. I'm curious if anything comes to that, but what it, what's happened is that we need to be proactive picking up guys, and even if you, you can talk down your pickup, because I could talk down the Alex Wood pickup. I still made it this weekend. I still started him this week for that two-start week, and I'm sure people are going to be able to talk down Dean Kramer, who's my next pickup, and here's what I'm looking for. Okay, this is a guy who had a mid-threes ERA last year for Baltimore. He's not a strikeout guy. ERA, he strikeout, what, 6.3 per nine or something like that, which is – that that's so low for any modern era, but especially in this day and age. But over his last six starts, he's got five wins. Yeah, wins come and go. But ERA three point three four. He's striking out four batters for every batter he walks. That's a good thing. And when we're chasing wins, a lot of people say it's a fool's errand. But you know what? When I'm going to chase wins, I'm going to do it with a good team. I think Baltimore might be the second best team in the American League, not the American League East, the American League. They're being better than yeah. anybody in the Central. And I look out west, right? I mean, it's hard to know if Texas has any staying power. The Astros have had almost everything go wrong. Talk about yeah. players to drop. Are you worried about Jose Abreu? Because I sure am. Oh, yeah. I'm looking yeah. for a pitcher on a good team. Dean Kramer's a pitcher on a good team. You have to massage his strikeouts. There may be some teams I wouldn't start him against. But can he have an ERA in the three somewhere and have some win equity going forward? And I, I realize I'm making the bar really low here. 
But I think he should be rostered medium and deep mixers, and I added him in a couple of leagues this week. Baltimore's a team I want to invest in. What about Alec Manoa? Do you, what do you do with him right now? I mean, I know you're not starting him, but like, where's the line there? You know, I almost feel like with guys like that, you just have to bench him. And then this is why I wish I'd done with Lance Lynn. You bench him, you wait for a good start or two, and then you try to trade him. I don't trust Alec Manoa long term. And also, Joe Sheehan was talking about this in his newsletter. We all thought Toronto's park was going to play hitter friendly. It hasn't so far. And, and Joe said, well, you know, that's going to turn eventually. I think he gave out a recommendation that the Yankees and Jays would score a lot of runs on Monday, which they did. Thank you, Aaron Judge. I Toronto, I, I, I was nervous to draft into their staff this year, and um, I, I feel kind of justified. Barrios hasn't been good. Manoa hasn't been good. Gosman's been good. But I'm not sure. Uh, Manoa, I'm glad I don't roster him, man. I, I wish I had a good answer for you. I, I don't trust them. If somebody was trying to trade Manoa to me, I wouldn't have a great offer for you. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be starting him. I, I wasn't in on him to begin the year, but, of course, I wasn't expecting this. But uh, he, has been, he has been awful. Um, up next for me is a prospect stash, and that would be Royce Lewis, another former number one overall pick. This was back in 2017, so the year after Moniac. Lewis has all the talent in the world. I mean, you watch him play. I mean, the, the skills are just so obvious. It's almost like an Alex Kirilov situation, his, his teammate there, but just hasn't been able to stay healthy. Had his second ACL reconstruction on his right knee last June. Really tough blow for him. Uh, but he's on his way back. Homer in his first game in AAA on Tuesday night, 422 feet, 108 mile per hour exit velocity. One of his three hits on the night. Uh, Lewis also has three steals through three re rehab games overall, which is a great sign for his knee that he's feeling frisky out there on the base pass. Lewis had five homers with a 940 OPS and 12 steals in 34 games in AAA last year. Also saw 12 games with the Twins last season, had an 867 OPS, so that was nice to see as well. Uh, playing shortstop and third base since returning to action in the minors. Looks like third base, obviously, Correa is the shortstop there for the Twins. So third base would be Royce Lewis's position in the majors. I expect the Twins to keep Lewis in the minors you know, through the end of the month, probably, uh, unless he's just totally gangbusters and ready to go. So you're going to have to wait a little bit on this, but... You know, look on your roster. Where are the fringy pieces on your team? Like someone you took up, uh, picked up a couple of weeks ago, like a Jack Sawinski. He has been awful for like three weeks now. Uh, I think he only has like five hits in the past uh, three weeks. Someone like that makes sense. Probably you've already replaced Sawinski in your lineup. You have Sawinski sitting on the bench. Like he's kind of a fringy player you could drop at this point. Speculate on Lewis. We'll come up play every day most likely, have that multi-position eligibility, and I think power and speed, there's huge upside there with Lewis. So the the second uh, first overall pick of his draft class that we're recommending, I recommended Moniac earlier, 2016. Lewis went first in 2017. And I, I don't know about you, I love looking at old drafts and, and trying to mm -hmm. figure out you know, what went right, what went wrong. Right now I'm looking at the first round of 2017. Drew Rasmussen has been the biggest war guy in that <laughs> round of course he just got hurt the Rays uh not going to have him yeah. for a while Tanner Houck is second Trevor Rogers Hunter Green Kyle Wright Adam Hazley is actually the highest rated hitter here which shows you just his class hasn't done much Ooh. Jake Burke Jake Berger's an interesting name he mm. started to, to percolate a little bit with the White Sox and, and look, this is another reason why Brent Rooker is on this list one reason why I think Brent Rooker is a real thing is you know, again first round pick he never really get a chance to play he was always blocked by people I think Brent Rooker's going to be worth half. He's one guy I was early on. He's on a bunch of my teams. I think Brent Rooker is going to hit 30 home runs. Now, I don't know if the A's are going to keep him. They're on a horrible pace. They're on pace to win like 35 baseball games, which is really hard to be that bad for six months. But I'm curious if some contender comes sniffing around for Rooker in the middle of the year, what they do with him. Right. Jake, Ber Jake Berger wasn't on either one of our lists, but uh, he has – the White Sox, of course, having kind of a start uh, star track season this year, but uh, Berger's home with the last couple of games, slugging percentage of 680, uh, 253, 329. The other two slash numbers, which are totally reasonable, age 27 season. Any interest in Jake Berger? I mean, who doesn't like burgers, right? <laughs> right. Um, I'm, I'm an unapologetic meat eater for sure. Uh, and he's been, he's had a lot of bad luck with injuries too. I think it's the Achilles. Uh, it's like, 
I think he had two uh, surgeries on that and he's come back and he, he has the pedigree too. Uh, just a matter of his ability to stay. He's healthy. 10. I just, I don't get this uh, I, uh, DJ. He's 10% rostered in Yahoo. Mm. You, can you find guys who are, who are slugging 680, just dr- dropping off a tree somewhere? Is, is there a power hitting tree that I don't know about? I, <laughs> I, I you know, this is going to be one of those things. that's all frustrating. I'm sure it's going to be 10% roster, but like in none of my leagues. Now he's available in uh a couple of my leagues, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pick him up in one of my leagues right now. How about that? It's pretty wild. His uh, his barrel percentage is 24.5 percent this year. He is in the top one percent in his max exit velocity this year, 118.2 miles per hour. Like the quality of contact is is legit with him. If you want to chase that, so let's chase the burger. Are you a, are you a hamburger or a cheeseburger guy? Cheeseburger for sure. And um, what are your condiments of choice? I mean, I would prefer bacon if possible. I, I also like like a caramelized onion on top, ketchup, no mustard. Yeah, you know? oh, I love I love all the mustards, man. Honey mustard being my favorite. Dijon mustard's really good. I, I love condiments. Period. Do There's you put ch- hot dog and do you put ketchup and mustard on your hot dog? Ketchup does not belong. I, I used to put ketchup on hot dogs when I was a kid. I don't know what I was thinking, but um, I've started to use less and less ketchup as I've gotten older. I think they're good for fries and some other things, but yes. uh, not uh, generally ketchup. Mustard is the go-to condiment in my house. I, I respect that. Honey mustard with like French fries, that's legit to me. That's my preference, honestly. Also, let's face it, ranch is great on everything. I, I know yeah. that's that's a lot of the condiment snobs are going to look down on that. This is you come oh. here. You think you came here ostensibly for the pickups? We're giving <laughs> you the, the 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 dope on the condiments. I could give you one. We got to do a draft. We got to do a draft of condiments at some point. We do. We do. I think I, that's actually a draft of my um, my former Yahoo show where we did drafts. Hannah Kaiser and I did a condiment draft, and I was over my skis because she. She's like a foodie. She she knows like she had condiments on her list I'd never even heard of. Yeah. So um, you know, as soon as we ended that show, I went to the grocery store and bought like five different things I've never heard <laughs> of because and just, it's just I'm so glad that she's on on the Yahoo team because she's a great baseball writer, but she she's just crazy. comes with she just has a great amount of background and cool ideas and just a different perspective that I think really adds to her flavor as a baseball writer. Let me give you one more pickup. We're all chasing saves. And the guy who just got a save, everybody runs to. Well, how about the guy who's not getting saved, but maybe he'll get them? I'm talking about Nick Anderson, 9% in Yahoo. Came out of nowhere, popped with Miami, had to run with Tampa Bay. Of course, he got hurt. This year, back in form with the Braves, two walks, 20 strikeouts, and 17 to third innings. And if you're pitching high leverage for a winning team, I think you're rosterable in mixed leagues. But what's going on? A.G. Minter can't get anybody out. Rysel Iglesias, velocity down. He's been all over the place since he came yeah. back. And I need Iglesias. He's a key to one of my yeah. one of my team's tout wars, I think, where we need saves. Iglesias came back. I put him in just in time for him to just do a tap dance on my ratios. But Nick Anderson could get this closer job if Iglesias blows up. He could get this closer job if Iglesias is hurt. I don't think they trust Minter right now. And even if none of that happens, you get a high-leverage reliever with great walk strikeout numbers on the National League's best team. In fact, with some of Tampa Bay's recent injuries, I actually think if you told me right now – Forget the odds. Just pick a team, and I'll pay your mortgage for a year to win the World Series. I'd pick Atlanta right now. And I know oh, yeah. Tampa, Tampa Bay's been the great team, but they, they've lost so many key people. Mm-hmm. I think Atlanta's the best team in baseball right now. So yeah. you give me a high-leverage a high strikeout walk lawnmower on the Atlanta team, great. If he becomes the closer, even better. And, again, oh, right now only 9% rostered in Yahoo. So I have a, a two-step here. If you just want to speculate on someone for the back end of your mixed league rotation – not someone I'm necessarily expecting big things from either of these pitchers, but just something where there's some tangible upside here. Carlos Carrasco coming back from the injured list uh, to start Friday against the Guardians. He's available in 82% of Yahoo leagues. With the track record that he has, I think that's way too uh, high of a number. We'll see if he looks better. I mean, he he obviously didn't look right prior to going on the injured list. The velocity was down. Maybe the downtime does him good. The other name I wanted to mention is Matthew Libertor, uh, Cardinals left-hander. He's coming up to pitch Wednesday against the Brewers. I mentioned earlier the Brewers are not a good team against left-handed pitching. Libertor available in 79% of Yahoo leagues. Now, this call-up is designed to give uh, some extra rest to everybody in the rotation, so just pushing everyone back a day. But I think there's a case to be made for him to have a rotation spot 
regardless of that situation. Uh, Steven Mass has been disappointing, been a little better recently, but still not very good. We know how things have gone for the Cardinals this season, though. They've been a little bit better recently, too. Libertor, we've seen him in the majors before uh, for a stretch last year, but the numbers in AAA this year have been really good. 3-1-3 ERA through eight starts, 56 strikeouts in 46 innings, and has the uptick in velocity to back it up, making him a lot more intriguing. He's someone who we've talked about as being a top prospect type of pitcher before, but if this velocity can stick, uh, I think he could be a mixed league type of pitcher. So keep an eye on him too. So you mentioned Coco, Mets pitcher. In, impromptu uh, two-round draft, who, who are your two favorite Mets pitchers of all time? It's a good question. I, you know, because I was born in 81, I don't remember 1986. Obviously, Gooden. Tom Seaver was was gone. It, so, I mean, I remember Gooden. I remember watching him pitch when I first got yeah. into baseball. 80, 84, but I, 85. That 85 season was ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to say Jacob deGrom and David mm-hmm. Cohn, though, because I think when I really started getting into baseball uh, was – right in that sweet spot of David Cohn before the Mets traded him to the Blue Jays. Uh, but he was one of the best pitchers in baseball, just such a professor on the mound. Uh, and yeah, I've always been a big David Cohn fan. Uh, you're ruining our, our aim to have disagreement. I, I knew we were both going to say DeGrom, but David Cohn was, I, I was hoping you wouldn't say David Cohn, just that, that Laredo pitch that he would throw, who throws from all these different arm angles. Sometimes he would, kind of hold he, he'd go into his rotation and he'd kind of hold it for a second and it, it's almost yep. like a point guard like modulating his speed dribbling the ball mm-hmm. um D- david and, you know all this talk now like the sweepers the hot pitch david cone threw a sweeper man it just nobody called it it's just a slider back then he, yep. he was he De, degrom is my favorite of all of them but david cone was probably for 10 years it's like I grew up in, in Boston. I was like, oh, is Clemens your favorite pitcher? No, it was Bruce Hurst, who had this great curveball that would just freeze batters. I love watching Hurst pitch. And the fact that Hurst would be in trouble more often than Clemens and maybe a little bit less dominant than Clemens, right. I took that as a feature and not a bug. I was such right. a Bruce Hurst guy. I even really enjoyed the Tim Wakefield run that he had. Look at Tim Wakefield's stats like four months into 1995. I thought he was the AL MVP into August. Unfortunately, the knuckleball doesn't always last for six months. He gets his head handed to him the rest right. of the year. But uh, David Cohn was a blast and a, and a hell of an announcer. And not only yeah, is he interesting and, and he's got a lot of, you know, he's got a great point of view, but he's also in touch with, and we see this, there are some pitchers, John Smoltz comes to mind, who don't want to accept a lot of the new yeah. realities or some of the new uh, facts or data in baseball. David Cohn's all into that stuff. He is. He's, he is. he's all into the analytics and the stats. And he's trying – look, we always talk about, right, It's it can't be stats or scouting. It's going to be a mix of both. It's going to be observations. It's going to be gut feel. But it's also going to be baked in some numbers. You have to marry those two things. I think David Cohn mm-hmm. as an announcer does that very well. I'm also a big Ron Darling guy. He's one of my favorite announcers too. I didn't enjoy Dar- – Darling was a good pitcher. I thought David Cohn was like almost like a borderline Hall of Fame pitcher. Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. I mean, go to his baseball reference page. At his peak, he was one of the best in, in baseball. He did win a Cy Young Award in, in 1994. His 92 season with the Mets, he was the only thing that was really watchable on that team. Uh, had a 2.88 ERA before the Mets trade. I remember being very upset uh, when that happened as, as a kid. But – uh, no, he's great. Rick Reed, I loved with the Mets too in in the nineties. Uh, very workmanlike pitcher. Uh, always, always like it. Kind of like the poor man's Greg Maddox uh, for a time when I was always the around the plate. Yeah, he, he'd always have those games with one walk, six or seven strikeouts. You know, he was easy to watch, right? Because if you ever got behind one zero, the next pitch was a strike. But he could throw it over a corner. He didn't have to just groove it down the plate. Uh, yeah, I remember Rick Reed. I remember he was on a like an AOL chat or something like that. You could ask Reed a question. So I oh, asked really? him. I, I popped in. I asked him a question. I said, "Do you have a nickname?" He said, uh, "They call me Reader." Oh, okay, Rick <laughs> Reed, Reader. But he was a very uh, underrated pitcher and one of my fantasy nice. pickups in the mid to late nineties. Before I nice. gave him to anybody else, I shared them all to my kept them all to myself back then. But uh, Rick Reed had a nice run for the Mets yeah. in that era, for sure, for sure. So good stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll save our condiment draft for next time. And remember to subscribe to Circling the Bases wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, be sure to rate and review if you like what you're hearing. Also, follow us on Twitter. Scott is at Scott underscore Pianowski on Twitter. I'm at DJ Short. Take care, everyone.